I said that uh, the speakers are all my friends or friend of my friend. And uh, uh, Laura M McKay comes from the Doherty Institute. Peter Doherty was a colleague of mine at Wistar. And anyway, uh, she um, uh, is from the University of Melbourne as well as the Doherty Institute. Uh, she um, uh, is a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne and uh, also the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and um, she has an independent group at the Institute studying cellular immune responses. Uh, and she is the recipient, uh, this sounds very interesting, she's the recipient of the Victorian Young Tail Poppy Award. Uh, you have, have to exp explain to us what a tail, oh, tall poppy, excuse me, what, what a tall poppy is. At any rate. Uh, <laughs> It's just an Australian science prize. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Tail poppy, yeah, tall poppy. Um, so thank you so much. It's such an honour to be here and to be a recipient of this prize. Um, I'm really, really very, very greatly honoured. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about some of my research, which centres around T cells. Now, oh, I can wear this. And so my, um, my group and my career for a long time has really focused on two main questions. How do you generate good T cell memory, and also what are the flavors of memory T cell subsets that give us the best type of immune protection. And so we know when a T cell first sees a pathogen or an antigen, you'll get this huge effect of T cell pool here, and then this pool will contract, leaving memory T cells that will, that will protect us, and of course this is the cardinal feature of um, vaccination. And really when we think about memory T cells, for many years, many people have really just studied the, the T cells that circulate throughout the body, our effector memory T cells or our central memory T cells. But in the past almost decade now, um, this is, uh, let's go back. Um, this has just sort of come into the textbooks in the last edition, is that there's um, a third subset of memory T cells that we call tissue resident memory T cells or TRMs. And these memory cells reside exclusively within the tissues and they don't exchange with the circulation. And um, a lot of groups are now working on these TRM cells, and it's really now relatively well accepted that if you want to get really efficient mucosal immunity, you want to boost T cell responses in your tissues and not necessarily just boost the numbers of T cells that you have circulating around the body. And a lot of our questions um, ask, within this effector T cell pool that we boost when we vaccinate or immunize, how can we gear these effector cells to becoming more of these tissue resident like memory cells rather than these uh, memory cells that circulate throughout the body? So um, just to give you a little bit of background on these T cells, they're a long-lived memory T cell subset. They're sequestered in tissues, and they were first found at really high densities at sites of previous infection. They're distinct from memory T cells that are found in the circulation. They have um, unique surface uh, markers which allow us to identify these T cells in the tissues. Um, and so, and over many years, um, we've been identifying these, uh, the transcriptional identity of these T cells, saying what makes them different, what makes these T cells survive in an autonomous fashion, um, independently from those in the circulation. And a number of years ago now, um, we published that um, if you compare the tra tr transcriptomes of T cells that circulate throughout the body, both in the spleen and also our naive T cells that haven't seen antigen, they cluster independently from these T cells that are embedded within tissues. And the T cells that are embedded in the tissues, we isolate from the gut, the skin, and the lung, and they were embedded after, after various um, forms of infection. For example, to generate TRMs in the lung, we immunize with influenza. To generate them in the gut, um, immunize with LCMV, this is in the mouse. And in the skin, we immunize with um, her herpes simplex virus. We've also shown uh, more recently that really the, these resident-like cells that are embedded within the tissues are actually more similar to other immune um, cell types such as NKT cells or tissue resident NK cells as ILCs as compared to circulating memory T cell subsets. And we've identified a number of genes which we're working on now which really identify these T cells as being very unique. 
So one of the cardinal features or hallmark features, if you like, of these T cells is that, is that they're in disequilibrium with the circulating T cell pool. And now um, these studies are really moving into the human realm. And what we found is that if you look at facial transplants, for example, you can find these T cells that are embedded within the skin tissue that have been found in patients carried across. And they'll be found several years later and they'll be from original donor origin. Also, um, many groups now have shown that these T cells have a really important role in mediating local protective immunity against infections. In the last year or so, um, it's been shown that these uh, TRM cells are important in mediating immunity against cancer. And there are also many studies now showing that having all these T cells in the tissue is not necessarily always a good thing. They can mediate um, various tissue pathologies in the skin, such as psoriasis or eczema, and they're also linked to many autoimmune conditions. So many studies in the mouse over the past, um, say, five to eight years have shown that if you immunize a mouse with um, various agents, you'll get a high density of these TRM cells in um, the area which the pathogen will replicate, for example. So again, he's using the influenza as an example. If you infect a mouse with influenza, you'll get a high density of these TRM cells in the lung. Um, in the liver, you'll get a high density of these T cells um, in the liver if you immunize with malaria. Now, um, the important point here is that if you embed these T cells within specific organs of the body and then rechallenge the mouse with that specific pathogen, if the T cells have the right pathogen specificity, you can get enhanced local immunity. Um, specifically by embedding these T cells in the tissue. And um, moving into the human space over the past few years, it's now been shown if you isolate pretty much all tissues now from all over the human body, you can identify these TRM cells as well. They have this, this very similar uh, surface phenotype to what we found in mouse, and also we've done transcriptomes on TRMs isolated from uh, human tissues, and um, a lot of the genes that we found uh, match up importantly with, within humans. But of course, why, why was this missed for so many years? And this largely comes down to the fact that it's what you can get access to. And of course, peripheral blood is, is largely what you can get access to. And um, to get a, um, a variety of tissues from a lot of um, you know, human donors, Donna Farber at Columbia has been a real pioneer of this. And she's got a great cadaver cohort where she can isolate TRMs out of a range of human tissues. So our group has shown that um, TRMs protect against uh, local infection. And if you infect with herpes once and you come back a second time, you can get site-specific infection, specifically at the region of skin where you've seen the pathogen before. But we started to move into saying, how can we utilize these TRMs in a vaccine-like strategy? And so to do this, um, we'll take naive animals and we'll embed um, pathogen-specific T cells directly in the skin. And these memory T cells, if they're activated in addition, then we introduce them into the skin a fraction are able to enter the epidermis, they're able to become these tissue resident memory T cells, and they're able to um, persist pretty much for the lifespan of the mouse. And they, so the important, one of the important facets here is that these T cells, they don't need to recognize antigen to persist within the skin. It's the unique microenvironment of the tissue that's really critical in keeping these T cells happy, and, and, the, and it's uh, the microenvironment that keeps these T cells staying put. So we embed these T cells within the skin, um, and they'll look something like this. So these are two of the um, hallmark uh, surface markers of a TRM. So if we look in the skin, these are of the same antigen specificity. I'm just skating on transgenic T cells here. Our TRMs express CD69 and the integrin CD103, the T cells that we isolate from the circulation don't. But we've got various tricks in the lab, and here we've really been trying to get at what subset of T cells are mediating the local protection that we can see against herpes. So we can do various tricks whereby we'll um, ablate all T cells from the spleen. We'll just have this population of resident memory T cells in the skin. And we can also go the other way around where we can ablate T cells out of the skin and um, introduce high numbers of circulating T cells. And then we take these naive, naive animals that have pathogen-specific T cells in different locations, infect these animals with herpes for the first time, and what we find is that it's only when you've got resident memory T cells in the skin you're able to protect against skin disease. And this is really a feature if you want the T cells at the right place at the right time. Even if you, it's nothing to do with numbers, say you can keep prime boosting circulating T cells up to really high numbers, but you really need to, if you want to block a herpes virus infection which will go silent in the dorsal root ganglia incredibly quickly, you want to stop this virus in its tracks and you want the T cells really there at the front line to be able to mediate um, this, this protection. And um, the, the protection that we see is incredibly um, linked to um, 
you know, the amount of T cells that you can embed within the tissue. So this is just increasing the number of T cells that we can embed within the skin, challenging here and look at, looking at viral load within PFU, and the more T cells you can get in the skin, the better when it comes to protection against disease. More recently, we've um, shown that TRMs can also protect against melanoma. So this is a really similar setup to what I've shown you before. We have um, B16 engineered with our herpes virus epitope, so we can use it in conjunction with our um, transgenic T cells here. We embed um, specific T cells within the skin, deplete T cells out from the circulation as shown here, so you've just got your TRMs in the skin. We challenge with melanoma, and what we find is that it's, um, this, is the com this is the takedown with tumors in naive animals, and here we've got both T cells in the circulation and in, within the skin. We've depleted T cells out from the circulation, and you can see that these T cells um, embedded within the skin are able to protect against melanoma. And what we find, if we keep taking out these cohorts now, and then we ablate our T cells in the skin, and we've challenged with melanoma, 30 days later, we then ablate TRMs from the skin, what we find now is that um, these T cells, uh, sorry, these um, mice now start um, presenting with tumors, showing that it's the TRMs that are contained within the skin which are mediating this cancer immune equilibrium. So what about patients? There have been a lot of um, studies coming out in the past couple of years now. Now we've got the surface phenotype and the transcriptome of these TRMs showing that in various cancers, patients do better if they have T cells that have this TRM-like phenotype. And we've shown this recently um, in breast cancer, and in collaboration with clinician uh, Shireen Loy um, at the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute in Melbourne, uh, we've done sequencing on uh, various tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from breast cancers. You can see there are many, this is gating on CD3 positive T cells, and you can see there's this unique cluster here that resembles the CD8 TRM cells that we see in mites. And again, we've um, developed a transcriptional signature here. And what we find is that uh, triple negative uh, breast cancer patients that have um, a higher density of TRMs or have this TRM-like signature, um, this is indicative of an improved prognosis against breast cancer. And what we found recently um, is that within mice and also within humans, if you gate on T cells that are embedded within the tissues compared to T cells within the circulation, and this is CD8 T cells of exactly the same antigen specificity, and you look at all the checkpoints here, what we find is that all the checkpoint inhibitor markers actually scream much higher on these resident T cells than on T cells within the circulation. And if we um, isolate these T cells out and we uh, block with anti-PD-1, for example, it's actually the resident T cells that actually are able to, you're really able to unleash that block and these T cells are able to produce a lot of gamma in response. And what we found again in uh, humans is, um, and also, well, this expression is pattern is both human and mice, but again, going back to our cohort of breast cancer patients, and again, it's these uh, patients that have a high, no, um, a high um, amount of this TRM-like signature that actually are better responders against anti-PD-1 therapy. So, one of the major questions that drive, th drive us, um, considering this kind of proof of principle evidence that there are these T cells that are embedded within the tissues, and these T cells are really linked to getting better immunity against infection and cancers, is how can we regulate these TRMs specifically? How can we enhance their lodgement in tissues, and how can we harness their protective function? And TRM differentiation is a really complicated process. We've been working on this for a number of years, and it's not just a effector T cell or a memory T cell that happens to wander into the tissue. These T cells are really very distinct, and they have really unique features and, and hallmark features that enable them to survive um, independently within the tissue. There are a number of different molecules that are involved, which we've shown under the year, over the years. But in short, effect, an effector T cell, you have to be within a short window of activation to become one of these TRM cells. So an effector T cell that is, is circulating throughout the body, that infiltrates throughout the skin, the first thing that these, this T cell needs to do is um, it needs to block um, tissue, tissue retention. So you need to be retained within the tissue first. We've, tra we've tracked many genes over the years as T cells um, come into the tissue and then get up into the epidermis, for example. Some genes that are shut down, such as S1PL1, this makes sense. This, this, this molecule needs to go down for T cells to be embedded within the tissue, and um, also uh, to shut down tissue egress. And there are also genes that need to be induced once you get into the tissue to enable their um, adhesion and survival, specifically within this compartment. Now, of course, it's not a one-size-fits-all um, situation. T cells that are embedded within uh, different tissues, there are similarities, there are, there are also differences. At the moment, we're largely um, really concentrating on the similarities between TRMs in different sites. 
But um, the microenvironment, for instance, there are different features between skin TRMs or gut TRMs, for example. And, but there are different um, tissue-specific requirements for the recognition of local antigen in the environment and also different cytokines that keep these T cells happy. So going back to our um, transcriptional signature, we've been working through a number of genes over the years. And um, we've been kind of honing in on certain um, genes that are uniquely expressed in resident T cells. And these are resident T cells in a wide variety of tissues and also in innate um, lymphocytes that also establish residence as well. And here's just one example here um, to show proof of principle. So there's a transcription factor called Hobbit, which is ex exclusively expressed in resident T cells. And what we find, um, or resident immune cells, I should say, and what we find if we take CD8 T cells and we make them, we enforce them to express Hobbit using a retrovirus, and this transcription factor, it's not expressed by T cells that um, circulate, it's not expressed in effector T cells, all those that are circulating throughout the body. But if we make CD8 T cells express it, and then we look at the lodgement in different tissues, compared to T cells that circulate um, either in the blood or that are found in the spleen, when you overexpress Hobbit and then look at the, your recovery of CD8 T cells, this is 14 or 30 days later, um, no difference on um, the number of CD8 T cells that you'll find throughout the blood or the spleen, but you'll get increased um, TRM lodgement in the skin, the liver, and in other sites. And just to show you an example going the other way, so um, here this is a gene S1PR5, which is important for um, tissue egress, and we take CD8 T cells in a similar fashion, we enforce these T cells to permanently express S1PR5, and what we can find is that this um, exclusively affects the lodgement of our TRM cells. You can see, again, um, no effect on the recovery of cells that we recover from the spleen or the blood, but we're able to um, dislodge our TRM cells um, from different tissues. And now we're working with different antagonists against this, mo against this molecule to try and enhance TRM cell lodgement. So um, this um, schematic really kind of sums up what we're trying to do in the lab at the moment. So um, when a DC first um, primes a pool of effector T cells, we're looking within this T cell pool, we're looking for precursor, precursors of resident memory T cells and the sort of genes that we can identify here. One thing that we have found is that for a T cell to go on and form one of these resident T cells rather than T cells that circulate, so um, throughout the body, it's actually T cells that undergo fewer divisions when they first see DCs for the first time. It's also T cells that um, don't express molecules such as KLRG1 and CX3CL1. So we're able to exclusively gate on T cells that are go going to go on to form this fate. Um, and then T cells will go up into the, um, into, the, into the skin tissue, for example, and switch on um, other molecules. And CD103 is a prime example of that. And some of the genes that we're finding that are expressed early, which can identify T cells that will go on to um, a resident memory T cell fate as shown here. Um, and we're doing lots of single cell analysis, tracking genes um, from the precursor stage up into um, commitment uh, when these T cells are long lived within the tissue. And then there'll be a second wave of gene imprinting within the tissue, which exclusively comes onto T cells once they're embedded within the tissue. And we're tracking these gene changes. And one of the things that we're tracking, and here this is just looking, um, this is a GP fate analysis of single cell within the lymph node, is we're tracking T cells within the lymph node at the earliest time after these T cells see antigen. And we, um, we're seeing um, a commitment divide here where T cells will go on to form effector T cells or effector memory T cells or resident memory T cells. And we're trying to identify these genes now and try to boost these genes to try and get more T cells to commit to this TRM cell fate. So just to wrap up what I've shown you today, um, I've shown you that these TRM cells, they mediate local immune surveillance and provide immunity against a wide range of infections and various malignancies. They're also associated with a better prognosis against various cancers. Importantly, they display a di distinct developmental program. They have a distinct identity as compared to circulating T cells. And so this really needs to be factored into the sorts of immunization strategies or adjuvants that you might use, because if you're just using T cells in the blood as your readout, you actually might be boosting the wrong sort of T cells if you want, for example, really great mucosal immunity in the female reproductive tract. These TRM cells, they have distinct requirements for their formation or survival. And also, um, we are able to manipulate some of these TRM-specific genes to enhance their lodgement, which will likely lead to improved immune protection, and this is something that we're working on at the moment. So um, just to thank everyone involved in the work, um, this is my team. We're relatively new. Um, at the melanoma studies were all um, carried out by my PhD student, um, Simone Park in collaboration with um, Tom Gebhard, uh, my mentor, um, Frank Carboni, who's given me absolutely terrific support, Shireen Loy at the Peter Mac, um, who's my collaborator on the Breast Cancer Project, um, and thanks so much for, for your attention. Thank you.
that was indeed a tall poppy. Uh, but um, so perhaps with your work on resident memory cells, you could clarify for us the difference between the um, inactivated influenza vaccine and the uh, LAIV. Uh, there, there really is no established correlate of protection for the LAIV, although one assumes that mucosal responses have some role. But uh, perhaps this could be done in ferrets, actually, that is, using the inactivated vaccine, the LAIV, to try to show whether resident T cells are, are the difference. Uh, well, without going into a lot of detail about LAIV, it, it certainly is problematic at the moment. Yeah, you, you make a really good point. And something to bear in mind, of course, is that this, this field and the description of these T cells is still incredibly new. Mm -hmm. And so really kind of looking at these um, T cells in any sorts of trials is only really just starting to be done. Only the, the proof of principle in the mouse system that, you know, if you have enhanced T cells in the parenchyma of the lung or in, or mm -hmm. in the nasal tissue, for example, will give you better um, in, you know, protection against um, influenza. That only came out, say, 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. So this is, in, this is incredibly new. And I I think that kind of moving forward, mm. I think maybe ferrets might be a good, really good way to go because, of course, you need access to the tissue. Mm. And you need to identify whether it is these T cells that are making the difference. And I think that we're going to be seeing that in the next few years that people are actually, now we can identify them and we can say, this is a resident cell and this is an effector T cell, which, is, which, uh, which wane over time. Um, I, th I think we're going to see those studies coming out relatively soon. Other questions for Dr. McKay? Y yes. <laughs> um, the switch, I mean, this is really exciting stuff. This switch from effector to TRM. Um, it, it, I have a detailed question, which is, all right, let's say it's the it's malaria program TRM in liver. Is it happening because it's surrounded by liver cells, or is it happening because the microbiome of the liver and cross Yeah, so I know a couple of groups that are now starting to work on the microbi microbiome, at least in the gut and the skin. And in, the, in the liver, I'm not sure. But I think in, the way I see it is, is that there's a two-wave of programming. There's a commitment which is made when you see antigen for the first time. And this kind of pre-programs whether you're going to become a short-lived effector or an effector memory T cell, which also doesn't live very long. It's interchangeably used with resident memory T cells sometimes, but they're completely different. They wane. And then there's this second step of commitment once you're in the tissue. And I think that there are interactions with different cell types within the tissue which are really important on pr imprinting the second part of the program and keeping these T cells happy within that tissue. Now the communication between different uh, cells within a tissue to you know being for being important in maintaining these resident memory T cells really there aren't many good examples that are being published yet but um, a, a lot of groups are working on it in the moment of at the moment of what cell types are important within a tissue which are important for keeping say a malaria T cell happy within the liver. And e mm. the, the, the studies on malaria came out last year as well, showing that, say, within a mouse, you know, more, embedding more T cells in the liver gives you better protection against malaria. And that was only last year as well. So now kind of dissecting it down to, you know, who makes the sort of decisions and keeping these T cells in the happy, happy in the tissue hasn't been done yet, as far as I know. Marcelo. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I absolutely don't want to oversell resident memory in any way because you absolutely want both. And the optimal to protection is having both. Um, of course, now there's a problem with circulating memory T cells will wane over time, at least the ones that ha the CD8s that have the ability to keep traffic into the, into the tissue. If you don't have repeated antigen stimulation, that's where the TRMs can come into play. But one of the major protective functions of TRMs is actually secreting a lot of gamma, which will recruit more circulating T cells more rapidly into the side of infection. So that's one of their key mechanisms is bringing in a lot more circulating T cells. So you absolutely want both. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh